Thank you. Please be seated. At this juncture, I, Ashok Ajmera, the convener of this uh, program, would like to recognize the presence of our partner organization. I recognize the presence of CA Lalit Bajaj, the chairman WRC Institute of Chartered Accountants of India, and CA Jayesh Kala, the coordinator from WRC for this event. Thank you very much for being partnering with us. We also recognize the presence of Sri Harjit Singh Talwar, the District Governor of Rotary International, District 3141, our service partner for this. Thank you, all the gentlemen. Now I request our JPF Director in charge, a handsome chartered accountant and a dashing personality, also engaged in the business of financial services, to give his welcome address and take the proceedings further. Mr. Ravi Jain. Ravi, please. Take it forward. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, Ravi. Ravi, you're on mute. Yeah. Thank you, Asobji. Good evening to everyone. who are attending this panel discussion on emerging new world order and opportunities for india i welcome all the office bearer of jito apex and jito professional forum all the distinguished panel of speaker and our associate partner shri kamal duggar ji from akhil bharatiya terapan divak parishad for joining us in this session businesses are faces huge challenges due to the covid 19 situation at the same time it has unfolded emerging new world world order and opportunities for india in today's webinar we will get a chance to know about such opportunities now i would like to invite some of the jito and jpf dignitaries to express their views they are true entrepreneurs they thrive in adversity and get satisfaction from solving the challenges so now everybody please welcome the person who revolutionized the education loan business in india mr ajay bohra vice chairman jito professional forum i would request mr ajay bohra to give an overview of jpf thank you ravi ji uh, just to update you that we have already reached our full house capacity of 1000 which is again uh, you know like a history in its uh, record we have done it this is the third time we have done it for the webinars uh, good afternoon everyone jito professional forum is a vertical of jito which consists of the professionals and which gets operated by the professionals its members include doctors lawyers architects banking and financial services professionals cas salaried executives and engineers well when we face these health triggered economic uncertainties in this in this interconnected and interdependent environment the importance of professionals and domain experts get uh, gets underscored and highlighted jito professional forum presents a platform where professionals can connect with the business community at large and collaborative advantage which is the key to survive and thrive during these uncertain times uh, today we appeal to all professionals to join jito professional forum to network with fellow professionals for unlearning and relearning thank you thank you ajay ji 
the next person i am going to welcome is highly inspiring he never gives up he is a philanthropist he is that pebble in that pond which creates ripple for change he is the motivator humble visionary versatile generous and he has all the qualities that most of us dream to possess please welcome sri ganpat choudhary ji jito president i request sri ganpat ji to enlighten us with his views yeah, you have been unmuted ganpat ji please help me ganpat ji please go ahead ganpat ji okay. we can hear you very good ganpaji. evening very good evening friends and i am really very pleased to welcome all of you in the jitto professional forms great seminar of the day today which is must needed for the country and for all of us business community leader who are going to listen listen this great seminar today i personally first of all my heartiest congratulations to entire team of our jpf professional forum mainly ravi बोहरा जी अजय जी बोरा अजमेरा जी कोटारी जी एवरी वन डोज टूडे माई वेरी स्पेशल थैंक्स टू संजय डांगी इज अ वेरी गुड एंड वेरी क्लोज फ्रेंड ऑफ मी यू नो हुज बीन इंस्ट्रूमेंटल इन सेंडिंग ऑल द मैसेजेस टू ऑल द पर्सन हु कैन बी बेनिफिटेड फ्रॉम दिस बिकॉज ही हैज इन्वाइटेड टू गेस्ट हु आर डायरेक्टली रिलेटेड टू दिस सब्जेक्ट ऑफ टूडे एमर्जिंग न्यू वर्ल्ड ऑर्डर एंड ऑपरचुनिटीज फॉर इंडिया is a really great uh, uh, opportunity for all of us to get benefit from all the distinguished guests who are having the vast experience of various uh, opportunities and investment in world around so uh, thanks those who have done the hard work for getting them on the screen so that all the our members who are there more than 5000 people are already participating and still many people are waiting i'm sure this will be, this is a one webinar who will have the record webinar whatever we have hold it till today and i am sure the hard work which put up by the jpf team will be in benefit of the jitro so thank you all the guests who have found the time to come on this webinar on our invitation i again welcome and my best wishes in advance to all of you jpf and all the members and distinguished guests and i am sure i am also going to listen and it will be in the benefit of the all the people who have participated thank you thank you very much and best of wishes thank you thank you thank you ganpat ji now please welcome the capital market veteran the gold medalist in chart accountancy and a company secretary mr sanjay dange chairman jito audit committee and ex jito apex director sanjay ji will be moderating today's event i request sanjay ji to take over the proceedings thank you ravi jai jinendra and good evening to you all and good morning to few of my friends who have joined from different time zones it is indeed my pleasure to be the moderator of this esteemed panel of speakers who are the stalwarts in their respective fields i want to thank you all for accepting my personal invite we are pleased to conduct a webinar today on emerging new world order and opportunities for india with that i would like to thank you uh, jito and jito professional forum for giving me this opportunity well the world is changing so rapidly during this time it's important to listen to the extremely talented pool of experts who are here with us today from new york and singapore they will help us to understand how they inter interpret the impact of covid 19 on the on the global economy how they plan to make investment decisions how they plan to decide on which countries to bet on and which sector to invest in i am sure that their perspective on the world economy and reshaping of businesses post covid 19 will help us understand the emerging thing in the post covid world so before we proceed further i would like to introduce my colleagues and friends from jito fraternity with me today are mr ravi jain mr ajay bohra mr ashok admera and mr paras bhotra and they will be assisting me in today's session i would like to thank them all for giving me the whole hearted support let's first start with the introduction of our panelists before we open up our interaction with them so i would like to call upon my dynamic secretary general of jito apex mr anil jain to introduce mr peter bodel thanks sanjay uh, i think uh, peter bodel doesn't need any introduction 
He's a managing director of Indus Capital and board trustee of Tiger Foundation, New York. Peter graduated from uh, uh, graduated with a BA with cum laude from Princeton University in '93 and obtained an MBA from University of Chicago Booth School of Business in 2005. He currently serves on the board of Untimer Gardens Conservancy as uh, treasurer and head of the finance committee. Bodil also worked in the office of uh, CEO of Chicago Public School as a director of special initiative. Before starting Bodil and Company, he was partner and senior analyst at Eastern Advisors Capital Management, an Asia dedicated hedge fund under the Tiger Management umbrella. Mr. Bodil was also the managing partner and portfolio manager of Bodil and Company Capital Management, where he managed an Asia focused long shot equity fund from 2010 to 15. Currently, Peter Boodle is Managing Director of Indus Capital, an Asia-dedicated investment firm with offices in Tokyo, Hong Kong, Shanghai, London, San Francisco, and New York. He is a senior research analyst based in the New York office. We thank Mr. Peter Boodle to be part of this uh, session today, and we welcome you in this session. Thank you. Thank you, Anil. Now I request Mr. Ravi Jain to introduce Mr. Mandra Shekhan. Yeah, thank you, Sanjay ji. The mutual fund industry deals in various various asset classes. Therefore, they understand the pulse of the investment market better than anybody else. We have a big sort of the mutual fund industry present with us today. Please welcome Mr. Manraj Sekhon, CIO, Emerging Market Equity at Franklin Templeton Investment, Singapore. Mr. Manraj has won the best fund manager award from Professional Advisor UK. He was also ranked in both the citywide UK top 100 fund managers. So now, thank you. Thank you, Sanjay ji. Now, please request you to uh, take it forward. Thanks, Ravi. May I request Ashok Ajmeraji to please introduce Robert Parry? Uh, it's indeed my pleasure to introduce such a great personality in the financial markets. Robert Parry graduated from the US Naval Academy in 1981 with a Bachelor's of Science degree in Management. He served in the U.S. Navy from 1981 to 1988 as a naval aviator. In 1988, he joined Kidder Peabody as financial advisor. He later worked as USB, Penn Weber, and Marin Lynch before moving to Morgan Stanley. He was in charge of 450 people in four branches in New York City and Westchester country who produced U.S. dollar 275 million and oversaw more than 40 billion of clients assets. He is currently the global head of wealth management for Jefferies. With, his, with this, ladies and gentlemen, I have great pleasure before, in presenting before you, Robert V. Perrin, the managing director, global head of wealth management, Jefferies LLC. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ajmer Aji. Can I request Ajay Bora to introduce my really close friend, Mr. Manish Singh. Hi, it's, a, it's an honor to introduce Mr. Manny Singh. He's the CEO of uh, Kavi Asset Management, which is a New York-based hedge fund in partnership with Blackstone Group. He has been granted 14, I repeat, 14 US and international patents on his name. He's a graduate of IIT Delhi, MS from Stanford University, and MBA from Wharton. Any student any, from anywhere in the world would dream to go into one of these, but he has all graduated from all three, IIT, Stanford, and Wharton. Uh, to add to that, previously he has worked with uh, Julian Robertson at Tiger Management and Eastern Advisors, a Tiger seeded Asia focused long and short term equity hedge fund. Welcome, Mr. Manishing. So, here I would like to request all the participants that any views from the panelists during today's sessions will be their personal opinion and that might differ from their corporate view. So for today's webinar, we will first have one common question to all the panelists. Then we will have a QA and a session where I'll ask them a couple of questions each. Post this, we'll take a question from the open forum. So as we all know, the pandemic we have witnessed in the last couple of months has had far reaching implications for the world at large. It has significantly impacted the world economic productivity, employment, income levels, disrupted businesses, and has resulted in many more hardship, not only financially, but also as a health crisis. Now, with the lockdown unwindings, central bank unleashing liquidity, economic reporting, and optimistic trials being conducted by 
vaccine candidates. So my first question to the esteemed panelists, and you all can take five to six minutes each to express your view. In the post-COVID world, things have changed considerably. How do you see the new world order and what new businesses opportunity, opportunities are emerging? Also, how do you see the global market performing? Do you think the bottom is in place and a new bull market has already begun? Or do you still see a lot of uncertainty? What is your advice to Indian entrepreneurs and investors? So can I start first with Mr. Peter Bordel from Indus Capital and can we have your view, sir? Uh, uh, Akash, can yes. we? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the kind introduction and thank you for having me on this esteemed panel. Uh, thank you, Sanjay Dungi. Thank you, sir. I remember clearly uh, trying to download my email in Bombay in 1996 from the server in Hong Kong when I worked at Jardine Fleming on some of the first participation notes in India. I was using a modem and a long distance call to Hong Kong to get through. It seems like just yesterday and the 35 minute call to Hong Kong for a few emails, I think cost me $90 how times have changed. So it is an honor to be speaking here today at the Jitto Professional Forum. I actually studied Jainism in high school in religion class. And that is another story altogether, but let me say I admired the religion then, and I'm honored to be a speaker today. We were asked to prepare a few uh, remarks regarding the post COVID world and investing opportunities as we look out longer term. I think when we consider the changes unrolling before us in the post-COVID world, we should be beware of recency bias. The human toll from the disease has been immense, and even more so, the economic response to put shock absorbers in place while the economy is still moving in order to avoid a crash landing. Combine this policy response with the drastic changes in workflow and daily living arrangements caused by social distancing. My wife is sick of me at home, and I don't blame her. So both the disease and the response have had a very real human cost, but also let us not forget the human ability to adapt and note the old truth, necessity is the mother of invention. Uh, we have the globe scientists in unison waging a well-funded battle against this new viral enemy. There are a number of treatment regimes arriving, including antivirals, monoclonal antibodies, inhaled nitric oxide, interleukin-5, convalescent plasma, to name a few. Even do-it-yourselfers are in the mix with the most interesting remedy I have read about being the antibacterial pills hikers use to purify water when hiking in the woods, which one adds to their water if they have symptoms to raise the oxygenation to kill viruses. Then of course, there are over a hundred vaccines in process. So choose your poison, but the world scientists are tracking this enemy very closely. I invest across including China and Japan and activity levels five months post initial lockdown in China show almost a full recovery on industrial activity. However, travel and other social activities remain subdued. That said, there are reports out this week that travel from China to Japan is fully booked for July, though on reduced capacity. And this is before a vaccine is in place. So I would remind how adaptive humans are when necessity presents itself. How do I see markets? I am bullish. Bull markets climb a wall of worry. We pay 20 times earnings right now for the S&P 500. For a 10-year US Treasury bond, we pay 120 times the coupon. And Treasury bonds coupons don't grow. So relative to yields from other assets, the S&P is demonstrably inexpensive. In addition, a number of leading businesses in the S&P run at negative cash conversion cycles meaning suppliers and customers fund them to grow. These include Apple and Amazon. How often in the history of markets have trillion dollar businesses not had to fund inventory to grow sales? And many of these large technology companies have benefited from COVID induced demand. Amazon hiring 175,000 workers on short notice since March. And the companies I talked to in Asia believe some of this COVID induced demand will not go away when the pandemic subsides. New habits may stay. So we pay 20 times earnings in US markets because we think earnings over the next 20 years will add up to pay us back for our initial investment. So what if this year and next year are lower than expected? There are still 18 years to go. 
and consensus earnings are expected to show acceleration of 20% over the next two years as we recover back to old earnings highs by 2022 or 2023 in the S&P. We can also look back at past cycles and crises, like the 100,000 dead in the United States from the bird flu in 1968, or the swine flu in 1976, or SARS in 2003, or even 9-11, especially the weakness in travel post that event. What we see from history is that in two to three years, things get back to some semblance of normality. And there is nothing today that I see that will make this pandemic any different. It's just that what this one happened in the time of Twitter. And as usual, it turns out grandma was right. You shouldn't put your hands in your mouth, ever. <laughs> thinking, thinking through longer term cycles, Warren Buffett has remarked on the 17 year cycle that the Dow Jones has progressed through since the 1950s. Maggie Mahar in her book, Bull, also spoke about this effect, where in the 17 year period, we have had strong bull markets and then followed by 17 year periods of weak to flat markets. And instead of ending a bull market, I believe we are beginning a new cycle begun around 2018, which will be propelled by 80 million millennials in America coming into their prime earning years, while at the same time witnessing one of the largest wealth transfers in modern history as the boomer generation dies off slowly over the next 20 years. It is rare in developed markets to offset the 65 year and older generation cohort with an even larger cohort with a median age of 29 years old. This group is entering their prime and I believe the businesses around this cohort will come to power this market going forward. And I would note that India is one of the few markets in the world that resembles these rare demographics. Considering trade roars and post pandemic flow of trade, I think the offshoring theme led by China will shift as the US realizes that China wants to play by its own rules. We are at the beginning of a cold war and China is as much to blame as President Trump. They have been offered membership in a trading organization since 2000, but have repeatedly refused to abide by the terms that the other members abide by. And Trump has taken a mercantilist approach demanding better being equivalent terms if China wishes to do business in the US as companies in the US must endure in China. And like Nixon was praised for opening up China, I think history will look kindly on this chapter where Trump called out the unfair rules of the economic state within China. We will see where we go from here, but I think investment will shift out of China and migrate around Asia. And so it is a historic opportunity for India if they want to build their manufacturing sector to capture this offshoring from China. I have additional views on the growing trade and cold war between China and the US and the tectonic shifts that may ensue. I have comments about gold and Bitcoin as stores of value and about oil and the upcoming changes in the transport and mobility industry, but I'll save those comments for Q&A and follow up. In sum, I think the US market is not expensive. A demographic wave is coming, which is very positive. And in follow up questions, I'd be happy to address the structural change coming from the US China trade war changes in the traditional stores of value and securitization being gold, bitcoins, and tokens, in mobility, combustion, self-drive moves to electric autonomous, and finally in sources of energy. I think oil is the new hay and wind and solar have arrived. So with that, I'll pass it on to the next panelist or to, to Q&A. Thanks, Sanjay. Thank you. Thank you so much for your such an insight view. And I'm so happy that uh, you have said that you already studied the gymnasium. Now, can I request I uh, uh, Manras, sir? Can we have your view, sir? Sure. Good, uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you, Sanjay. Thank you, everyone, for this opportunity. It's a real pleasure and honor to be here. I have a huge amount of respect and admiration for the Jain community. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to be here uh, with you all today. Um, I think Peter has done a very good job of uh, covering a lot of ground already. Uh, so I'll try and address a few of the, uh, the areas where I think there are pressing questions about trying to reconcile what's happening on the stock market and contrast that with what's happening in the economy. Um, clearly, the last few months have been extreme in terms of what's happened to the health of individuals around the world, what's happened to the economy, what's happened to the stock market. And really, when you look at the last couple of months of economic data, we've seen in the US, for example, some of the best economic data in terms of growth and employment uh, in a very short space of time, in a matter of weeks, 
turn into some of the worst economic data. I think it's very important for us to separate what's happening in the health of the world with respect to the pandemic from what's happening to the economy and separately what's happening to the stock market. Now, clearly all of them are related, but it's very, um, it's very easy to assume that what's happening with respect to the pandemic will naturally lead to effect on the stock market, but clearly there are very different mechanics at play here. Uh, uh, now, in terms of the health of the world, clearly we're seeing the end of this wave of the, uh, the COVID-19 situation. And whether you look at what's happening in the US, Europe, in Asia, the number of cases, the fatalities, all of those data points look a lot more healthy. There are certain pockets around the world. India is one of them. Brazil is another one where there's reason to be uh, perhaps cautious. But generally, the picture is looking very, very uh, much more positive than what we saw as recently as a month ago. Turning to the economy now, the impact of coronavirus, I think, will have very profound, long-lasting effects on the global economy. And we're yet to see that play out. There are going to be portions of the economy that have been hollowed out uh, that are unlikely to come back because of the distress on balance sheets and the degree to which their business models have been challenged and are unlikely to sustain themselves in the future. And I think we have to be very careful about putting all of the global economy in one category because there are many different degrees of movement, many degrees of recovery, and certainly some parts of the economy that are shut down and going to be shut down for a while. Now, turning to the stock market, uh, as we all know, the stock market is a forward-looking mechanism. Uh, what we've been trying to do over the last few months when we look at the, uh, the companies that are affected by coronavirus is really look at what the impact of the earnings in this year and the earnings in 2021 are on the long-term value of the business. Now, when you think about the long-term intrinsic value of any business, one or two years doesn't really make a huge amount of difference. And typically it results in about maybe five, a bit more percent of valuation destruction. So I think we need to put that in perspective. But what is clear is that the, the kind of scare we've seen in the last couple of months has been nothing like what we've seen before. And I think this has real impact on the way people think about portfolios and how they protect their portfolios. So what I will say is that whilst uh, I am positive on markets uh, generally, I think we should continue to brace ourselves for a very volatile ride. Now, there are a lot of distortions that are being caused by the amount of liquidity that's being pumped into the economy from central banks, from governments around the world. We've not seen anything like that before. Uh, some of you would have seen just in the last uh, couple of days, the uh, governments in Europe are looking to spend something in the region of 1.3 trillion euros to support their economies and markets. That hasn't even begun yet. So I think that amount of liquidity is having an impact on the market and that will continue. Uh, in the short term, I would say there are two or three things that are not being priced into markets that we should be wary of. One is a second wave. Uh, I'm not a medical expert, I don't pretend to be one, but I think we've all tried to study this very closely and I think we cannot rule out the risk of a second wave of infections in many parts of the world. The third, uh, the second thing we need to be uh, conscious of, of is the upcoming uh, year end, whether it's autumn or winter in the Northern Hemisphere. And given the, the degree to which a lot of countries in the West found it difficult to handle this situation. I think we should be very careful about how they manage the, uh, the winter. So I would say a second wave and a winter pandemic are not being priced into markets and we need to, uh, we need to be careful of that. Now, turning to the stock market very quickly, I think what we're seeing in the stock market is a very polarized, bifurcated picture. So if you look at the period close to the global financial crisis, post 2007, 2008, you saw capital investment, manufacturing, 
um, around the world suffer because there was very little in terms of demand growth and demand sustainability. It was really led by the consumer and services and technology, the recovery we saw over the last 10 years. So you saw a very uh, polarized picture in terms of the, the economy. Some parts were doing well, a lot worked. I think now in the post-COVID world, you are going to see an even more polarized and bifurcated economy. Uh, and in some sense, the future has been brought forward. So things that we were all expecting to happen in 2022 or 2025 or 2030 even have been brought forward because of the pandemic. So certain parts of the economy are doing very well because their business models are totally in keeping with the world we live in. And certain parts of the economy, and we all know what they are, whether it's retail, whether it's real estate, whether it's hospitality, uh, leisure, transport, etc., are finding their business models heavily challenged. So the net result is you've seen huge value destruction in that section, and you've seen huge value uplift in the parts of the market that are doing well. The net result is that the overall market has gone up because the proportion of the market that's accounted for by the new economy is significantly larger, whether you're looking at Asia or you're looking at the US and, and other major markets. And that's the net result. So whilst the overall market may, may give us the impression that everything is okay, I think, and the same is true is in, in India, when you look underneath, you will see that actually the market's been quite efficient in ascribing much lower valuations to those companies and those sectors that are left behind and much higher valuations to that, to the other side of the market. And when you look at interest rates around the world, even in India, discount rates, whatever your required rate of return is, that's come down a long way. So when you have new economy businesses with very long-term, uh, long-duration value creation, long duration cash flows, because these are companies that are going to continue to build businesses and build value over a period of time. When you value those businesses with a lower discount rate, the uplift, as we all know, is significant. So, so I think it's very important to, to, to make that distinction in markets. And in my own view, I think the general trend of that will continue. But as we go through phases of normalization, so right now we're going through a phase of normalization where people are focused on everything getting back to normal. So the traditional businesses are doing well, but I think there will be a reality check over the course of the next few months and quarters where the new economy businesses will continue to do well. Um, I share the concerns about the US and China. We can talk about that later on, uh, but I'll leave my comments there for now. Thank you, Sanjay. Thank you, Manra, such a, such a wonderful view. And I think we, sitting at India, we can take a lot of call from your, this thought now. Can I ask Manny Singh, can we have your view, please? Hi, Sanjay, and thank you guys for having me. Um, uh, Jito is, uh, I got introduced to it through Sanjay, and uh, the, I really admire the work that you are doing and the, the contribution of the Jain community, of course, everybody knows about. Um, I, I agree uh, for most part with uh, what uh, Peter and Anrad just said, but I, I want to think about uh, a riddle, uh, if you will, uh, as it relates to the economy and uh, world markets. So as we all know, COVID has been a, a truly global phenomenon. It's a, a global pandemic. You know, almost every country in the world has been affected by it. And I would argue that the U.S. has been worse affected than most. I mean, if you think about some of the numbers that uh, came out post COVID, we we're talking about 20 to 25% unemployment. These are numbers we have not seen in uh, many generations. Uh, 100,000 people dead, the highest mortality count in the world, and uh, GDP contraction well into the double digits, I think, for at least two quarters. And yet, when you turn to the public markets, uh, the S&P as of last night's close is only down, call it four or 5% for the year. Now you compare that to a market like India, where uh, you know whether you look at Nifty or Sensex, they're down almost 20%. The rupee is down another 5%, and so in dollar terms, the Indian market is down 25%. When you can argue that in fact the U.S. has been much harder hit by uh, the pandemic itself, the health implications and the real economy implications of the pandemic. 
And so it is a bit of a riddle. It's a bit of a conundrum, right? I mean, why, why, are, why is an economy that seems to be uh, disproportionately affected adversely, uh, why, are, why are its markets sort of hanging in there when uh, some other markets are not? And I think the, uh, the, to, to really figure out what's going on here, uh, I think there's two different things we have to consider. The first reason or the first explanation has to do with the nature of the government response in the U.S. versus a place like India. So in the U.S., I think perhaps because we had learned our lesson from the 2008 financial crisis, uh, it was a, a, an overwhelming bazooka of a response where, uh, as uh, everybody knows, 13% of GDP, uh, it was a package that was uh, Congress, the Fed, and everybody came together. But the important thing about that is that that stimulus was in the form of direct transfers, so helicopter money. And so in the US, uh, every man and woman got a $1,200 check, every child got a $500 check, they added $600 a week to your unemployment benefits. Uh, it was a $350 billion uh, so-called PPP program, which is uh, essentially uh, forbearance loans for small businesses. They give you a loan and then they forget about it. And so if you look at the effect of essentially handing out money to people, uh, what the data is showing us now is that incomes, incomes uh, were actually up between 5 and 10% in the last reported period, right? So people are unemployed, they're sitting at home, but they're making more money than they did when they were working a job. And then you combine that with the fact that you're stuck at home and you can't be spending on you know, restaurants and travels and things like that. And the credit card data shows us that, in fact, spending in other categories, things like home improvement and apparel, et cetera, uh, spending has actually gone up. And so the U.S. response was forceful, it was direct, and it was demand side. Now, if you look at the Indian response, uh, in contrast to that, the Indian response has been much more structural or, uh, let's say, supply side reform versus a one-shot demand boost. Right? So the RBI came out and uh, essentially offered credit guarantees for small and medium enterprises. Uh, they backstopped NBFC loans uh, to some degree. Uh, the government has put in place measures for uh, rural job creation. Already the RBI coming into the year had cut the repo rate by over 100 basis points. And so these are all changes that are much needed. And these are all changes that uh, in some sense are more durable than just handing out money to people but the transmission mechanism of these changes is much slower. They take a while to disseminate through the real economy. And so I think the Indian markets are uh, reflecting the difference in the nature of uh, the government response. The second difference, of course, between the US and India is that if you look at the S&P and how it's composed, 25% of the S&P of the S&P is IT companies. Uh, these are, you know, the, the so-called FANG or Fama stocks, you know, Facebook and Amazon and Microsoft and Google. And another 20% roughly is healthcare. So about half the S&P is what I would consider new age defensives. These are, you know, ironically, uh, they, see, they used to be seen 10 years ago or 20 years ago as growth stocks. Now I think it's abundantly clear that a business like Google or a business like Amazon uh, they're really defensive businesses because it's very hard to compete with them and their moats are almost unsurmountable. And so uh, the nature of the S&P has gone from being more growth to more defensive. And, this, and the Sensex, uh, on the other hand, or the Indian market, still has a pro-cyclical tilt to it because banks and financials, for example, are uh, close to 35% of the Indian index and uh, they have a more pro-cyclical tilt. So what we know about the nature of risk and the nature of flows is that the, uh, when the world markets start to reflate because central banks generate liquidity and that liquidity starts to find a home, is that it, it's, it's like when you have a stack of cups and you're pouring water down them, it flows along the curve. So at first, it flows into treasuries, and we've seen the US 10-year correct from you know, uh, 180, 190 basis points to call it 60 or 70 now. And then it goes into defensives, which are the kind of stocks that I talked about in the U.S. market. And then it supports DMs. And then over time, it makes its way uh, into the emerging markets as you go further out on the risk curve. And so I think if we are to see a continued improvement in the real economy in the West, 
and uh, uh, the uh, and the U.S. markets. I think at some point emerging markets will have to participate, and India is better positioned uh, than most. So uh, that's just this idea of looking at the U.S. and looking at what's happened in India, uh, both on the markets and on the stimulus side. Now, uh, very quickly in terms of the U.S. markets and are they expensive, I agree with uh, both the uh, uh, the awesome speakers that went before me. I think that it used to be that uh, 20 times PE uh, was expensive for S&P, but one of the main things that I learned working for Julian is that valuation is not a determinant of direction. And so at a time when the 10-year is 70 basis points, and a lot of sovereign yields all over the world are negative. Uh, why would you not pay 25 times for a market where you know you get a 4% earnings yield plus those earnings grow 3 to 4% a year plus equities intrinsically are inflation hedges? And so uh, the U.S. market is not expensive. Uh, I think there are issues that have come to the surface. I think there are risks. It's an election year in the U.S. Uh, at some point, you can have a return of cases. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not going to be linear. It's not going to be free from volatility. But fundamentally, uh, this is not like the U.S. market is uh, sort of, you know, turbocharged or overshot or anything like that. So I'll stop there and um, look forward to questions and, uh, and Q&A. Thank you, Manny. As always, your views on are outstanding. Your knowledge, especially in India and U.S., will help us to make a very informative decision. Now, finally, can I ask Mr. Robert Perrin, sir, and if you want, you can take that with you. And can, can we have your view, please, sir? Yeah, I mean, you know, our, our views, right, are, you know, are, are encapsulated more in what do we not know, right? And what we don't know, right, is what's going to happen with this virus. And that's leading to we don't know how deep this economic um, recession is going to be. Right. And I would just say that, you know, there's 40 million people here in the U.S. that were working 90 days ago that are not currently working. Yes, some of them are getting more money than they were making. Some of them, you know, are getting an extra six hundred dollars. But, you know, we don't know how long this is going to last. And, and the Fed doesn't have enough money to give people this kind of money forever. Right. So we don't know the depth of this, um, you know, slowdown. We don't know how long it's going to take. Um, we can guesstimate and estimate what's going to happen to S&P 500 earnings, but it's really, it's really a guess. Um, and we really haven't completely understood all the solvency issues that are going to occur between, between you know, in, in, in the economy. Just thinking about the small coffee shop that's in Main Street, Ridgefield, Connecticut, that can't pay the rent, so now the landlord can't pay um, his taxes and the landlord can't pay his mortgage and how is that going to affect the banks? Like we haven't really understood the complete um, ramifications of how that's going to go. Um, so there's, you know, there's a lot of negatives there, right? What's the one positive? The po one positive is the Fed. And it isn't just the Fed, it's the Fed and the EU basically coming in with money and propping everything up. Um, you know, the, the Fed's balance sheet has surely shown everybody, um, you know, the power to, you know, to heal all wounds. When the markets were correcting in March, you know, the biggest problem, you know, for, I would say for me um, and my advisors and the clients that we service, right, is what happened to the value of certain fixed income securities, okay? The triple B area of the market where there's been a lot of debt insurance, you know, there was literally like no bid. Um, and there was no bid until the Fed came out and said, well, nope, there's going to be a bid. We're going to buy this. 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 And all of a sudden you got a bid right under bonds. Um, and again, it starts with they're buying treasuries. R rates are coming down. You know, the spread versus treasuries, which is what everyone looks at, got real wide. That's come down. OK, the next thing is now we start rotating risk asset wise. You take something out of the 2008 playbook make rate zero, force people into risk assets, and, you know, we'll, 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 you know, we'll get people invested, right? But, you know, the, the other thing is, is that, you know, they've, they've used the word bazooka. Um, they've, they've also said that they're willing to step up and do more 
if the outlook deteriorates. So, you know, the Fed, right, is what's driving this. The Fed is driving where the 10 year is, where the Fed is driving where the one year, where, 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 you know, where the one year is. And, 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 and again, it's forcing money kind of into risk assets. I mean, short term interest rates have been cut to almost zero. Um, you know, un unless you're in the investment, you know, the, the lower investment grade or high yield space, you're really not getting much of, you know, much of a, much of a return. But what we have seen is the ability for companies like Boeing and Ford to come into the market here, right, and get, you know, get deals done. Been very, very, very confidence boosting to the overall market. But when you look at all of this, it's all dependent on COVID, right? And everything in the U.S. right now, when you, when you, when, when you go through and you think and you look about it, is all about the vaccine. Um, and I know there's a lot of naysayers out there with respect to we've never done this before and it's, and, and it's too hard and, you know, this is going to be rushed and all there's been is failure before. But never before in the history of the world has this much computing power, this much energy, this much expertise, this much collaboration, um, in addition to a government backstop, um, been issued here. And, you know, Anthony Fauci is, you know, a uh, face of, um, you know, our government when it comes to this virus. I mean, you know, he's hopefully optimistic that this is aspirational and doable. So I think, you know, as we look at things, um, and again, you know, there were five companies picked, um, you know, you know, you got Moderna, AstraZeneca, Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson, Merck. There's also 95 other players out there trying, trying, trying to come up with a vaccine. Um, that's really what's driving this. And if I, and I can say, what's our market outlook for the, three, the, the next three to 12 months? Are we going to get a second wave? I mean, we're starting to see some of that data, you know, here in the U.S. Um, we've got some civil unrest going on here in the U.S. It's causing a lot of people to be out and about together. We don't know what the impact of that is going to be. So I think what we're going to see over the next month is what's the news with COVID and it's spreading? What's going on with the vaccine? Um, is the consumer really going to keep spending, right? What's the Fed reaction going to be? How are we going to be dealing with this China thing and the, the idea of deglobalizing the supply chain? Oh, and by the way, we have an election. Okay, which, 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 which would tend to be very paralyzing, right? So I would say with the S&P at 3,100, maybe a little bit ahead of what's going on, I'm not going to doubt the innovation and ability of modern science and people to be very, um, you know, innovative in solving problems. But we're certainly in a very unique place. Probably the easy money has been made. And, you know, you're going to have to be very selective as to what you do kind of on a go forward basis. And we're having a, you know, we're, you know, and I've asked Ted Soror, who I work with, you know, to join me here because I thought it would be helpful, right, to understand, you know, it's one thing to talk about this stuff, you know, to an esteemed panel, you know, like this and, 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 but, you know, clients at the end of the day are people with money on the other end of the phone, um, you know, living through all of this. Um, and the, the most interesting thing is Ted has been doing this for over 50 years, you know, started at Merrill Lynch, um, was a key player at Bear Stearns. We now have him here at Jeffries in our wealth management division for, you know, you know, for about nine months. And, and I mean, and Ted, <clears throat> I think can give some perspective because, you know, businesses are run by business people. Um, when those people have you know, concerns, right? They, they, they kind of change behavior. And I think if we could get into a little bit of Q&A with Ted at some point, this would be very helpful for the group. Oh, sure, Robert, when I'll take the next question, I'll definitely, I'll uh, put towards that Ted. So thank you, thank you so much for your uh, valuable suggestions on the uh, US market and the, what happening on the COVID side. So my next question regarding emerging market, and I'll address it to Peter Bordel, sir, and Manras. Since you both understand emerging market very well, there has been a cold war going on in terms of cornering China due to disappointment related to COVID, its trade standoff with America, and the China and Hong Kong issue. However, the world is still, still highly dependent on China for microchips, semiconductors, chemicals, pharma API, textile, steels, raw material, and many things more. 
will it ever be possible to break the supply chain dependence on the china what will be the supply chain look like in the post covid world who will benefit from realignment of global supply chain and do you think india could benefit from global trade and reallocation of investment due to this scenario so you know a lot of talk is going on within the india like a lot of business will come to india a lot of industry might can shift to india and this is the common question within all the investor community in india so sir can peter sir can you throw some light on this is india really going to get some benefit out of this over to peter sir akash and you um, thank you sanjay can you hear me okay yeah, we can hear you sir yeah. great um listen i think um this is a cold war um and china as we look at it is making a dramatic shift to their own technology chip stack and i think that will they hope will separate <laughs> them from the rest of the world and allow them to innovate and communicate safely on their different technology platform we'll see how successful that is japan invested heavily in memory in the 80s korea in memory in the 90s and 2000s and i think it is about to be displaced by china who are investing heavily in this tool set in the 21st so we have against this backdrop uh i spoke before about the cold war we have sort of essentially a new apple versus ibm microsoft war on the horizon except now it is between states and we'll see how it plays out commercially regarding your question of offshoring uh out of china every business i speak to is taking business and supply chain out of china i have not spoken to a single business of late who isn't many of them are doing business with the same counterparties in china who are simply opening up new factories uh run by their people in vietnam and indonesia and other places for assembly or other less value added uh additions um but i think there's an enormous opportunity for india as i mentioned before um however i would just comment that you know even back in the 90s when i lived in hong kong um the easiest place to do business in asia was probably singapore uh the hong kong one for efficiency uh but singapore was the clearest simplest place to do business they always say you know in china only one guy talks and he's the guy that's in charge and in the, india everybody talks you don't know who's in charge and i'd say india is the most complicated place to do business i've ever seen um i think that's improving under modi i think there's lots of low hanging fruit uh so i think the simpler india makes it to move to india uh and with willingness to bring foreigners in which has traditionally not been their strong point i think that shift under modi is possible and in process but um there's a long way to go but that is opportunity thank you sir sir manra sir can we have your view on this the same question sure um you know i think i think the whole narrative around china has shifted in the us uh pre trump the narrative was china is a huge market we need to have uh, a part of that market we need to grow we need to engage china influence them and over time we will do well and um, and we will influence their behavior uh, and that was the general view and that narrative has changed in the last few years and this is you know whether it's a republican or a democrat it's changed where uh the the ideology in china is deeply entrenched they are a global uh they are global uh enemy in terms of their sphere of influence and in addition to that we're never going to be able to change their behavior and in the meantime they're stealing our intellectual property and now you know the conversations i have with friends and colleagues in the us whichever political leaning uh, they may have it's very difficult to see a different view from that um so i think the chinese recognize that and they know that in the short term trump is going to say certain things because is only focused on one objective which is getting elect reelected in november and everything else is a function of that including including managing the uh, the pandemic so the chinese understand that there is a practical 
uh, reality to what Trump is saying. But I think if you listen to the substance of what's coming out of the White House, anybody who watched uh, the long awaited press conference from, uh, from Trump last weekend, uh, there was really not a lot at the end of it. And I think, you know, when, when you have 40 million people unemployed and you need to get the economy back on track uh, because you need to win an election or you want to win an election, and you have China, which, you know, going back to the point that uh, we were talking about earlier, the amount of money that's been spent globally by governments, either through central banks or, or by the state, the one country which we expected in January to open up the checkbook and, and spend was China that hasn't done it, right? So China's been able to, to deal with this risk by policy and obviously the nature of the Chinese system is that they can manage uh, a crisis like that in a very different way. So China has many more bullets to deal with any economic risk that they haven't spent. They're not spending anywhere near what the Europeans are spending. They're spending nothing near what the, uh, the Americans are spending, etc. cetera. So, so, so when you have 40 million people unemployed and you need to win an election and your business community is saying, we get all of that, we get all of the concerns, but we need to do business and we need to make a return. And China is still, you know, one third of global GDP growth and that's not changing. There has to be a middle ground. So I think in my view, you will see lots of uh, rhetoric, lots of commentary, lots of, uh, lots of uh, feeling and emotion about what's going on in China. But I think once we get through the election period, that will die down. I'm not saying that this issue is gone and this Cold War is coming to an end, but I think there's some very, very fundamental practical realities that are not going away. And I, if you think about what the Chinese want, the Chinese have three objectives at any point in time. One is to maintain stability and in this order. One is to maintain stability come what may. The second is to grow the economy and grow and improve the quality of living of everyone. And the third is to establish their strategic influence around the world. Now, we know that the way Trump has been conducting foreign policy in the last four years, there's a huge vacuum globally. And this is a perfect opportunity for the Chinese to fill the gap on the third objective. So if you're sitting in Beijing right now, Actually, Trump being re-elected is not a bad outcome. Okay. Thank you, sir. I'll not waste uh, time because we have lined up many questions. So let me straight go to the, my next question to Manny. Manny, as we all know, many countries around the world have announced stimulus package ranging from 10 to 22% of their GDPs. The Indian government also announced a $28 billion US dollar fiscal package, which is roughly 10% of our GDP. However, the effective fiscal cost is only 1% of GDP. Do you feel that these stimulus packages will accelerate the economic growth going forward? How do you find that effect of the rating on the different countries when these kind of countries are giving fiscal packages? And recently what we have seen that Moody had downgraded India from BWA2 to BWA3 this week. So what will be the impact on India in terms of getting FI and FDI in flow? So what do you read out of all these things? Manny. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you for the question, Sanjay. Look, the short answer about the rating situation is uh, don't worry about it. Uh, ratings agencies are notorious uh, in terms of uh, you know, missing the ball on things. They're lagging indicators of things. And frankly, the risk from not doing enough, not doing more, given what I consider a generational opportunity for India in a number of sectors, uh, far outweighs a ratings downgrade from a Moody's or an S&P. So you have to put the, the credit downgrade of India in the context of what is happening in the developed world, right? In the developed world, uh, you have the US Fed, which is out buying junk bond ETFs, okay? going just way out on the curve, uh, financing uh, a paper from Boeing and Ford and whatnot. 
And then in Japan, you have the Bank of Japan, whose stimulus package is close to 25% of GDP. And they're just not even pretending anymore. They're just going and buying stocks in the stock market. And they still can't get any growth. And they still have negative yields. So I think for India to worry too much about running up the deficit, et cetera, at this point, uh, I think is foolish. The most important thing the world needs is growth. And India has unique levers for growth. And we cannot lose sight of that. The other thing that I think the ratings agencies don't consider is uh, the move in crude. India is a uh, oil dependent economy. It's, a net, it's one of the few uh, large economies remaining in the world that are uh, net oil importers. And I think the, uh, the, the, the advantage to both the trade deficit and the fact that CPI stays in check when crude comes down, uh, I think are huge tailwinds behind India's back. And I think to a large extent, the Indian government gets that, the RBI gets that. If you think about 2008, uh, the RBI cut the repo rate from, it was over 9% at one point, I think about 9% to four and three quarters. And it took them seven months to do that. And CPI at the time in India was close to 10%, all right? Now you look at what they've done already entering the COVID crisis, the repo rate in India was 4%. They'd already cut it 100 basis points and inflation in India is more or less, you know, non-existent if not well-contained. So, uh, and thanks in some part to crude. So I think the, the ratings thing, I wouldn't worry about it. I think the RBI is, uh, <coughs> that's it. I think the bigger thing that I worry about with India, rather than uh, running up its deficit or its credit downgrade, is that it will miss a generational opportunity. And it is something that, as you know, I feel extremely strongly about. I think India has an opportunity to be the next manufacturing powerhouse of the world. And uh, we are not doing enough. Even the stuff that the Modi government is doing uh, is not getting the kind of um, megaphone or kind of publicity that it deserves uh, among corporates, et cetera. I mean, to reiterate the point that uh, Peter and uh, Manraj made, uh, already people, large corporates, you know, Nike and uh, automotive companies and apparel companies, electronics makers, they were already talking about uh, diversifying their supply chains away from China, particularly the ones that are over-indexed to China uh, because of the trade war. And now with everything that's happened with COVID, people have realized that they cannot be 60, 70% indexed to China. And even a small move away from that is huge for a country like India. I mean, if you think about China versus India, China does about $2 trillion a year in, exp in exports. India does less than 20% of that, okay? Both countries have roughly 1.4 billion people. The Indian demographic, if anything, is younger than the Chinese demographic. So we have a lot of young people that can do these things, take these jobs. Uh, and wages are, you know, in India are comparable to what they are in China. So the, I think the problem is that becoming a manufacturing hub for large international companies is not about cheap wages. That's what we've seen from the example of the other Southeast Asian tigers. It's about land reform. It's about labor reform. It's about credible deregulation. And India is making steps in that direction. For example, in the last budget, uh, you know, the finance minister cut the tax rate. Um, but people don't believe it. And uh, there's just, just widespread skepticism around it, which is that it will not last and they will botch up the execution. And it really pains me uh, when we talk to corporates in vertical after vertical, and uh, we, we look at where supply chains are, how they're retooling themselves, and India is not in the top three destinations. So let me tell you, uh, in electronics, okay, every dollar that's moving out of China is going to, these are the top three countries in, in, by category, every dollar is going to Thailand, Vietnam, uh, Taiwan, Singapore, this is the top four. In textiles, is going to Vietnam, Indonesia, Laos, and Thailand. In automotive, it's going to Thailand, Malaysia, Vietnam, and Mexico. India is not in the picture. India needs to be in the picture. So Manny, what is, whatever you say, can I ask you one more question on this? What do you think India can do differently in order to boost the economy and attract more foreign investors? And according to you, what are the stumbling blocks for the global investor to invest in India? Like what you said is like India need to do a lot of things. A lot of things are happened by other Asian countries. What is your view on that? What should India do differently in terms of getting the economic think, growth accelerate and getting the more money from the foreign investors? I mean, look, the, the 
I think at the end of the day, reform has to be credible. And, uh, you know, it's not just about wages. It's not just about labor force. Uh, the, where, if I'm uh, Nike and I'm making an investment decision about where I should start my next plant and that plant will be there for the next 30 years, uh, I have to know that the next government that comes along will not hold up my permit. The next government that comes, comes along will not uh, unionize my labor force or weaponize my labor force. They will not jack up taxes on me. I will be protected by some sort of judicial system. And those are the things that historically uh, India has fumbled on, right? I mean, one regime comes in, introduces a certain set of measures, approves some projects, and the next regime comes in, everything is dead, you know, come back to us, reapply. That leaves a very bad taste in the mouth, right? That's nobody wants to deal with that. So, and particularly when the difference is China, where once they give you an approval for something, because it is so top down and it is driven by, you know, the, the, the machinery is well oiled. Uh, once they give it to you, it's yours. So uh, I think India has to, this is really a credibility uh, issue and it's about really advertising to the international community that India is open for business. So uh, I, I think in a nutshell, that's sort of, uh, obviously this is a complicated topic and one that as you know, I feel very strongly about. Uh, but uh, in a nutshell, I think that's what uh, India needs to do. Now, the other thing that I will say is that in the post-COVID world, there are certain themes that have uh, now taken root where uh, India has a natural skill set. And I think we're going to see uh, in India and Indian companies uh, do pretty well in certain areas. Uh, now, I'm thinking of things like, you know, work from home, uh, remote education, uh, telemedicine, esports, things that are going to become a bigger part, uh, you know, a lot of stuff in the, in the healthcare side. Um, th these are all areas where India has had, historically had skill, you know, whether it's software, whether it's medicine, whether it's pharma. And uh, so I think India is well positioned to uh, take a lot of share in uh, things that are now emerging in the post-COVID world. So like many, uh, I take your last question and then I go to other, like what you said is like a lot of business models are getting changed, like what we have seen in recent past that work from home, a lot of like OTT players shopping online. So do you feel this kind of trend is going to continue or it's going to, it's, it's really sustainable? Uh, I mean, look, I, I, time will tell. I mean, you know, you need a crystal ball to uh, figure some things out. But what I will say is that the, uh, you know, when you think about uh, how some of the great discoveries of the world have happened, you know, penicillin, for example, uh, you're in the middle of a war and then you need something and, uh, you know, a guy comes up with penicillin and you try it and now you revolutionize something. I think what COVID has done is it has shown to us uh, how a different way of life is possible. Now, at the end of the day, will people stop eating uh, in restaurants and stop flying and stop? I don't think so, right? At the end of the day, people are social, they want to interact. But we've learned, for example, that you don't have to sit in an office for uh, you know, five days a week for 12 hours a day. You can be just as productive or more productive uh, sitting at home. Uh, look at an event like this, right? We have people from all over the world and we're all dialed in and this is a very productive way to do it. Uh, same thing with telemedicine, right? Uh, up until uh, three months ago, I think there was some hesitation. People don't want to go on the app. People are reluctant to do a consult over a virtual uh, platform with a doctor. Well, now you don't have a choice, right? Uh, so if you don't need to talk to a doctor, well, you know, you better figure it out, right? So we're seeing huge spikes all over the world, including in India. Uh, telemedicine consults are going up, you know, 8x, 10x, uh, because uh, people have to do it. And once you do it, you realize it's not that hard. It's very convenient. And uh, in some ways, it, you know, it should become a part of your life. So I think those changes, we're not going back on, right? Things we've realized uh, actually make our life better. Uh, these tools, this, these technologies, I think those are here to stay. Thank you, Manny. I have many questions and I know my, I have a lot of panelists uh, have to give some more time because a lot of participants also may want to ask a lot of questions. So I'll cut short a lot, lot of my questions so or my straight question to Jeffries, either Robert or Ted can reply. As we all know, interest rates in the developed countries are near zero. 
how do you read this also in such a framework where fixed income returns are close to negligible how should investor allocate their fund across the different asset classes and what will be the risk associated with that strategy and i would like to tell you in on this all my participants as a lot of people who deal in gold so they want to know your view as a wealth manager what is your view on the gold going forward is is, is it a really better asset class than the other commodities over to you sir Right, Ted. Question. You want to take that? Yeah. Yes, yeah, sure. Yeah, Ted, you can apply. Thank you. So I think what we're seeing now from clients, more than ever, and more than the 2008-2009 uh, financial crisis, is more of a lifestyle crisis. Uh, we're basically seeing people that are changing their whole lifestyle. Whether you said, as in, as the other uh, uh, speakers said whether it be to, to work at home, whether it be to be able to, to shop at home, whether it be uh, a, able to change their habits. And, and we're seeing that as far as them being much more cautious towards investing. Um, in, in reference to investing, right now people are looking at the, the changes that are happening in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the businesses going forward, whether it be uh, in technology and the FANG stocks and whether it be in pharmaceutical and healthcare. Um, as far as the, the, uh, the confusion uh, with the other kinds of companies and whether they'll recover completely or not, uh, that remains to be seen. And I don't see a lot of the wealth clients uh, looking in those areas. I still think they're going along. But I do have to say that uh, as far as a risk reward, uh, they are not committing money um, as if they did in the recovery of 2008 to 2010. Um, they are still much more cautious and much more liquid. Um, uh, as we do have in our portfolios a percentage of, of gold and silver. And in the last couple of weeks, we've been buying more silver than gold. We do think it's a good store of value uh, to have a, a 5% position in your accounts in that. And at this point, uh, a year ago today, uh, you know, gold was uh, 1298 and silver was 15 uh, and today you have silver at 17 and and gold it's at, at 1700 so we think that there is more value and the entry point for silver is much more attractive at this point thank you sir thank you thank you so much for your insight my next question to mr peter as you since you have a lot of understanding on the global market especially u.s market Given that the U.S. market gives direction to the other world market, including India, what are your view on the U.S. market going forward? Moreover, the Nasdaq seems to have discounted the COVID crisis rather quickly and is close to its all-time high today. Is this reflecting any major trend emerging out of the technology space, especially with regards to the FANG stock? Lastly, we have recently seen large FDI inflow into India that would reliance Geo by Facebook and many more P's. How do you read all these developments? Can we have your view on this going forward? Can Indian corporates, big companies, the larger capacity guy can have a lot of FDI from these people? Peter, sir. Hmm. Yeah, no, uh, thank you. Listen, just a, a couple of very interesting set of questions there. I, I spoke a bit about my thoughts on the US market. Just to, to maybe to recap on a couple other points already made, um, you asked about uh, how India could improve. Um, my biggest point would be turn uh, permissions into reporting. There are so many permissions one needs to receive in India. Why not change every single one of those permissions into a report and make that guy who gives permissions be a reporting receiver. And when I just report on the business I'm going to set up, then things can be done in aggregate. And so that would be the most uh, efficient way to, to make it more an enviable place to come. Um, and gold, I'm in gold and Bitcoin, I, I'm a Bitcoin guy. I'm happy to talk more about that, but uh, I think that is the technology of the future. It is the, it is the gold of the future. Gold is worth 10 trillion. Bitcoin's worth 175 billion. Um, they're both stable. They do not rust. Uh, Gold makes better jewelry, 
and makes better wedding presents. But uh, they may, in the future, I think Bitcoin will be worth more than 150, 175 billion. U.S. market, uh, I would I would just echo what Nanny said. Um, you have these very large companies that are technology focused. The market is not the economy. The U.S. market is very different than the overall economy as a whole. And I think that those businesses, you know, just look at Zoom. We're not we're having this meeting because of tech. And so tech will continue to perform. Uh, you know, the cloud is eating software. I think that is, you know, software was eating um, the world. That was Andreessen, but now cloud is eating software. So we are now more and more reliant on the cloud. I think those businesses going forward will uh, succeed. Azure at, at, at Microsoft and AWS at uh, Amazon, which represents half of Amazon's value today. Um, those businesses are here to stay and will, are here to grow. Uh, China's Alibaba, etc. So I think I, I feel that the U.S. market is not overvalued. I think it is fairly valued. And I think the technology and healthcare space there and the innovation uh, are going to power the market going forward. And so I think there are good things to come from the U.S. Uh, into the future. Um, you had one last question, and I forget what it is, but uh, oh, maybe F. So Reliance Geo, um, you know, it's a remarkable thing when you can offer people uh, 30 times the bandwidth at sort of uh, a little bit more than what they were paying before, if not in line. Um, so you make something 30 times better. Um, I think that's pretty attractive. You know, one megawatt a month for a megabyte a month versus a megabyte a day. So um, I spoke to a very large company in the US a year ago, a year and a half ago that said that they were doing more packet delivery into Reliance Geo early in Reliance Geo's formation than they were into Comcast in the US. So I think that platform as a packet uh, circulation tool is incredibly powerful and I think Facebook has acknowledged that and I think that will continue to grow and I think it's unique as a platform because of uh, the 30 billion he spent um, and keeping it dark until he lit it up. So I think um, that has a wonderful future and um, I think it'll be good for India. So in continuation to my discussion, what risk do you see in deglobalization and protectionism as recently our Prime Minister of India has requested the nation to be Atmanibar, it means self-reliant. If, if all, all these things happen, what are the repercussions for this on the global market or global trade rather? Well, yeah, it's a great question. You know, you, you have to go back to history, I think, as well. After World War I, after we had, you know, pre-World War I, we had a very borderless society. You didn't need a passport to travel through the countries of Europe. And after World War I, which also coincided with the largest pandemic in, in modern history, um, that you know, recorded history, not recorded, but uh, sort of modernity since the radio, let's say, or not radio, but telephone, um, that pandemic closed borders and that war closed borders. I hope we do not have a war now, but uh, trade wars turn very belligerent quickly. Um, so I trust that does not happen. I think the opportunity is for India to, to take share of uh, what had been a manipulated currency to keep it cheap and low wages uh, in China and a very efficient place to do business. Um, and, it, you know, if, if India can get more efficient and more welcoming to foreigners, um, I guarantee you uh, business will flow there. It's just a question of uh, how much easier they can make it because it was pretty hard before. So can I request any of my panelists of, if they would like to ask anything? Yeah, uh, yeah Sanjay, uh, a great session so far. You are moderating fantastically well. And I think you have covered most of the questions. And, and one more request before I you speak. Manny, I think you can speak Hindi. So there are a lot of <laughs> participants would like to, okay. love to hear you for five minutes, two minutes. If you can have your view in Hindi, it can be great. Yes. Actually, I requested Manraj sir also. He said, Sanjay, my Hindi is horrible. So please don't disturb me. I so, either you're the best guy. If you can really, Admira Ji, before you speak. If yeah, so I'm not sure. I'm asking in Hindi. I'm asking this question. If you understand, it's in English. It's in English, but you can reply in Hindi. 
what are the inflationary consequences of the large stimulus packages which are given the countries world over and why we in india are bothering so much about the as you rightly said about the fiscal deficit and rating so okay as far as india is concerned it is going safe but what are the consequences to some of these large countries of the world when they are just distributing the money this is one very important question to you mr many ha ah, it fresh ka dekhiye so far uh, we see no signs of inflation right in the us and i think a large part of that has to do with the employment picture to agar aapke 20 million 25 million log unemployed hain ghar baithe hain to aap unko agar haath mein paisa bhi pakda rahe ho to wo uh, does not feed into systemic inflation right uh, and so i think because of where uh, the the global demand picture is and clearly the world economy has gone through a huge exogenous shock um, we see no signs of uh, systemic inflation uh, part of that is the unemployment picture uh, which you know has again uh, ratcheted up even when unemployment in this us in the us was at historic lows 3% 4% unemployment thi jab tab bhi inflation us mein nahi dikh raha tha to ab to dikhne ka sawal hi nahi right so uh, inflation in the us is has not been a problem and the question is why राइट right? तो इसके दो रीजन हैं कि इन्फ्लेशन हमें क्यों नहीं दिखती है यूएस में एक रीजन स्ट्रक्चरल है स्ट्रक्चरल रीजन ये है कि जब से चाइना वर्ल्ड इकोनॉमी में प्लेयर बना है यूएस और चाइना के बीच में बहुत एक कन्वीनियंट टिट फॉर टैट टाइप की रिलेशनशिप है चाइना जो है उसने यूएस का डेफिसिट फाइनेंस किया है चाइना ओन्स ऑलमोस्ट ट्वेंटी यूएस ट्रेवरी issuance is sitting with china and in the process uh, china has used its currency you can argue manipulated currency and has provided cheap goods into the us market. right so both a symbiotic relationship dono mein hai jahan us ke deficit china finance karta hai aur in return us ki sari manufacturing china mein and that has put a lid on prices the other thing is technology technology has kept prices low uh, jo kaam 10 log kiya karte the wo amazon ke warehouse mein do log aur do robot karte hain aur usse kya hai ki bahut cheezon ki price uh, it keeps a lid on prices right the prices don't go up so uh, i think ye structural reasons hain kyu inflation nahi hai world mein ab aap usme unemployment add kariye to demand side gets soft तो अनएम्प्लॉयमेंट तो इन्फ्लेशन और कम हो जाती है एंड द थर्ड थिंग इज देर इज अ मेजरमेंट आर्टिफैक्ट द वे दैट सी पी आई एंड पी पी आई इज मेजर इन दू एस इट इज ए बास्केट ऑफ गुड्स एंड सर्विसेज उसमें क्या है कि फूड जैसी चीजें अपैरल यू नो फुटवेयर इलेक्ट्रॉनिक्स इन चीजों का बहुत बड़ा वेट है डिसप्रोपोर्शनेट टू हैव मच वी स्पेंड ऑन दैट सो जहां प्राइसिस बढ़ रही हैं यूएस में they are in things like education the cost of education in the us has gone up tenfold in the last 30 years rents have gone up much much faster almost a you know double digit clip uh, compared to the prices of uh, shoes or food you know a pair of shoes actually costs less today than it did 30 years ago and i think it's is an it's an artifact of measurement that the index overweights into goods whose prices have been kept low because of china and because of technology so uh, i think cpi yeah. reading jo hai wo upar nahi jane wali hai aur because cpi wagaira contained rahenge uh, developed world mein inflation nahi hogi aur india ke liye plus crude low hai to for all of these reasons uh, inflation is not on the scene uh, despite all the money printing now that doesn't mean that that will not change in Five years, but in the near term, for us to worry about something that will kill us in five years and miss the opportunity that we have today, I think that will be real, real pity for India. धन्यवाद आपने हिंदी में इतना अच्छा बोला। एक क्वेश्चन संजय भाई। अजमेर जी only one minute। अजमेर जी only one minute because Robert and Ted want to have a five minutes cut talk. And, uh, hey, you know what? No, yeah, um, a question. Robert, Robert, you can you can start because I I missed that actually. 
So you can have a five minutes conversation between you. Any question you want to talk to Robert and with Robert, which sorry, right. Ted can reply for you. So, um, you know, I would say to, to to all of you, you know, on the call, um, thank you very much for 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 attending this. You know, but one of the interesting things about what's different about this market than where it was 60 days ago is the capital markets are now open. So in the very beginning of 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 April. Like we were able to bring some special purpose acquisition companies and a couple of biotech deals. Um, Ted had to leave the call because we've done six deals this morning. Okay. Oh. You know, across technology, across biotech, across healthcare. Um, you know, the capital markets are alive and well. Um, you know, in terms of coming in, you know, and raising money. And it's interesting, it's raising money in all of the areas, right, that are focused on what does well in this type of an environment. So Ted had to leave, but I, but, 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 but I think, you know, the point that we wanted to kind of bring out is, is that, you know, the vast majority of our clients here in the U S are business owners. Okay. Um, and their businesses have all been affected. A lot of retail, a lot of real estate, a lot of, um, you know, restaurants, um, you know, I mean, you know, hotels, I mean, a anything, it, you know, to do with the airlines and flying and, 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 and travel. And like, for the most part, there's a huge number of executives in that space, right. That are looking at the markets and just, they're, they're literally like, this is such a disconnect from reality. Um, I don't know if you can hear me, but you know, this is, this is such a disconnect from reality and you know, that's the one thing that, you know, when you hear from clients, it's like they don't understand why the S&P is at 3,100, right? They don't want to hear about, the, you, you know, that that's only 20 times earnings. I mean, when they're looking at businesses that have no earnings. So, you know, at some point, the connection between what's going on in the economy, you know, like the stock market isn't going to be long-term just healthcare and tech. There's other things out there that... Um, that, that are, that are, that are, that are, that are, you know, that are going to be important. Um, but, you know, it's, just, it's, just, it's just, it, it, look, it's an interesting time. Um, you know, there's a lot going on, um, you know, being flexible um, and being cognizant of what goes on, probably the most important thing. But again, it's all going to, it's all going to be based the, the, the next six to 12 months on, is there a second wave? Is there a vaccine? Um, and, and is the economy going to recover? What's up with the consumer? And how are these elections going to play out? That's going to drive what's going on. Thank you so much, sir. I know I troubled you a lot in the last two weeks. Many, many. That's okay. Calls. So thank you. Thank you so much for uh, uh, accepting our invitation. Mandra, sir, anything what you want to say, like what are the next, what Indian investors should think? What, what are the things which make you to come to India and put your more weightage to India? What are the things you feel like where Indian investor can really feel proud? Yes, yeah, this is the thing I can I can think the better market ahead going forward. Yeah, uh, no, I think you know I'll touch on some of the uh, points already made before. I think India is in a very interesting place right now because the change in the world is creating an opportunity for India. Mm -hmm. Uh, right now, it's just an opportunity, and India has to grab it with both hands. And you, you have to take that opportunity. And I go back to what I said earlier on. The future has been brought forward, and I think it was uh, Manny or Peter who said that India is blessed with a skill set to take advantage of the new economy in terms of language, in terms of, of uh, education, in terms of the size of the the youth, and so on. And I think uh, this is an opportunity to really uh, grow in a lot of those areas. India already has a great position in IT, IT services. Indian talent is around the world. But unfortunately, the key challenge for India remains jobs. And that's a challenge today, and it's a challenge for the next 10, 15 years. And we all know that jobs really primarily need to be driven by manufacturing. Uh, services can drive a lot of job growth, but not enough for India. So, so I think that's a challenge for India. Uh, I think in the short term, the financial system in India needs rebuilding. Uh, for the kind of growth we need to see in India, the financial system is weak. 
there are not enough uh, credible lenders, there are not enough uh, credible companies to invest in for a country of India's size. And I would say this is an opportunity for the authorities to think about consolidation in the financial system. The system was already very, very badly hit by the previous crisis. And so to get to the next stage, you need a healthy financial system. And we all know uh, from our conversations with banks and other lenders that financials in India are very, very conservative, and I don't think that's changing. So I think you need to see consolidation in the, in the sector. Um, and then the last point I'll make, and you touched on it earlier on, is you know, how is the world going to change? And I think in some ways, a lot of things are going to change. In many ways, not a lot is going to change. So you know, whether you live in India or in China or in Brazil or Indonesia, uh, certain things are not going to change. People need to find jobs. They need to come to the city. They need infrastructure. They need to improve their quality of life. And, and that's not going to change. So people will adapt. And, and working from home is a great option if you live in, in the developed world or, or where I live or some other parts of the world. But it's not an option for the vast majority of people that are going to drive growth. And the same is true in, in China. So I think we have to be very careful not to extrapolate what's happening today with what's going to happen in the uh, in the longer term yes there will be efficiencies and if you can save yourself three hours of commuting time in mumbai or two hours in london or whatever it might be the world is a better place and that will be good but we have to be very careful to recognize that that's not an option for a lot of people so we need to adapt and and they will adapt if I can come, come Ismail, I think let's take a few questions from the participants. It will be injustice not to ask. Yeah, you. yeah there was uh, one question on, uh, I think uh, Peter can uh, answer this. Uh, is that, is there any chance just like in 2008 uh, of any major financial institution falling because of COVID problem? Is there any chance for any major financial institution failing now? Just like Lehman in 2008. I think in the U.S. system, um, absolutely not. Um, we have very underlevered uh, businesses. Um, you know, their core equity uh, capital ratios are far more secure and underlevered versus uh, 12 years ago. And um, then you look at you know the the largest part of their loan books in general is mortgages. And, you know, people haven't taken out a home equity loan in 13 years. So, uh, and house prices have gone up quite a bit. So the, the loan to value ratio of the book of, you know, Wells Fargo and the other largest lenders in America is very secure, if not under levered. So I think the risk there is low. Now, uh, mortgage servicing because of forbearance and others. There are some mortgage servicers that uh, risk, um, but you know, as we have, as I have commented, um, I think we get back to business reasonably soon, and um, you know, the, many of those businesses will restart, uh, and uh, we'll see if we get any of the servicers uh, can uh, uh, sh struggle through that. They will uh, require some capital probably. But I don't think any of the major systemic banks have any issue whatsoever. Uh, but maybe Manny could speak to that as well, or uh, 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 or Robert. Uh, yeah, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Peter. Uh, one question is to Mr. Robert: That what are your views on the oil industry and the oil global and other global commodities, and what will happen to this oil exploration companies in yeah. USA who are doing yeah. shale oil? Exploration with the oil prices going right. all-time lows. What okay, are your I'll, views on that? All right, I'll pull out my little oil card, right? But I remember, you know, and this is kind of forgotten, you know, that right about the time that this whole pandemic thing was exploding, and I'm going to use the date, um, March 10th, right, in 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 in, in New York. Um, you know, the Russians and the Iranians decided, I mean, excuse me, and the Saudis decided that they're going to have a price war, right, um, a supply war on oil and just started flooding the markets with oil. And no one knew what to do with all this, right? 
and it was kind of like, I hope they back down. I hope they back down. The you know, they're not backing down, right? And they end up with those all this oil, you know, essentially all over the world with no place to go, right? And everyone's like, you know, thinking about storing this, and you know, the 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 contracts going negative in 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 in, in whatever. I mean, even, you know, look, I mean, oil industry demand, right? Demand for oil goes up slightly every year. And it goes up in much more in the emerging markets than it does here in the U.S. We're all trying to be more energy efficient, you know. But I mean, you know, pendulum swing in two directions, and you know, they the, this one swung way out to 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 where you know where thing you know where things are going to be. Don't underestimate the the the, the, the ability for don't, don't underestimate the ability for the U.S. shale industry to figure out how to lower costs, but you know. I think we've reached a better equilibrium place with respect to oil prices. You see the dramatic rise in the XLE and oil stocks. Um, things seem to be stabilizing, um, you know, in, you know, kind of in that price point. And, you know, that's kind of where we are. I again, it's going to be a determining factor with respect to, um, you know, how these things go is what is the consumer in the world doing, you know? Um, I mean, I bought a tank of gas on the on the uh, on the 12th of March. I didn't refill my tank for two months. Um, interestingly enough, I refilled my tank, you know, a month ago. I need to refill it up. So you can see, like, you know, we're all starting to venture out more. It's all about, you know, what kind of what kind of end demand are we going to have? I hope that answers that question. Okay, but one question from my side, but to Peter or Manraj, whoever can address, and in your opening commentary, there was one uh, important thing which Peter and Manraj and Manny, all of the three have highlighted that bond yields maybe are trading at 120 times, whereas S&P is trading at 20 times. So this was a big indication about the fact that P multiples are going to rise. So how do you see in context of the fact that in last five, 10 years, value investing has not worked and high P companies are continuously getting more and more higher P's. So at a time when the yields are so low and P multiples, when you are saying 20 times and India probably also is at 20, 22 times, whatever. Uh, so how do you see things panning out? Which are the sectors you see that the valuations are going to just hit the roof or probably investors are going to see a lot of tailwinds so they'll jack up the prices? And what is the trend you see in valuations from a value perspective? And from a growth perspective, and uh, recently I was hearing to Aswat Damodaran as well, and he was putting up data on his webinar saying that value stocks haven't worked and P which were trading at low P have gone down further lower and higher P multiples have got re-rated. So how do you justify this kind of dichotomy which is there in the market? Okay. Okay. Peter or Manraj, uh, if anyone can take up this question or both of them, please. Well, well, is that question? Sure, why don't I just start? Uh, so I think, uh, you know, the, the market of the last 10, 15 years um, has challenged the whole uh, debate about growth versus value. And uh, when you look at what's happening in, in, in the market, not just today, but even in the post-crisis period, what you saw was, you know, relatively low growth rates very low inflation. Uh, so companies that you would describe as traditional value companies had very little pricing power and, uh, and, uh, and very uh, limited visibility in growing their businesses. Um, so this whole uh, assumption that over time, growth and value normalize and, and there are swings that bring both into balance, I think, has been challenged for some time, and I think will remain challenged. Uh, you, you heard uh, Manny refer to uh, the, the tech stocks in the US, the FANGs and so on as defensive growth. Um, you know, it wasn't, it, it's, it wasn't so long ago that these were seen as stocks that were trading at very high multiples uh, that, that had a lot of growth built into them, but hadn't really delivered. So the whole shape of the market has changed. And, and I share the view that inflation is not a risk uh, for the foreseeable future. And if you put that all together, it's very difficult to see an environment where traditional value in the way that some people describe it is going to do well. So I, I, think, I think that whole 
question that whole labeling of companies between value and growth has to be looked at. Okay, we will take a question from the audience, uh, Mr. Vicky Oswal. Uh, Vicky, you can unmute yourself and ask your question, please. Mr. Vicky Oswal. Uh -huh. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes, yes. We, we can hear you. First, the artist, congratulations, Sanjay Bhai. And thank you, sir. Successful webinar. Was to get in the webinar, I took nearly about 10 to 15 minutes to get the access. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sir, so my two questions would be, uh, I'm into real estate. So what would be the two key points you would suggest for a real estate developer to sustain one or two years? And is it the right time to get into stock market for investments? So who would like to take this question? Many, I think. Many, many. Mr. Many. Real estate इसमें कोई एक्सपर्टीज वगैरह नहीं है लेकिन वट यू नो आई फॉलोड दिचुएशन इन इंडिया एंड आई थिंक आई वुड वी रेट दी एडवाइस दैट पीपल लाइक ओ दैट कोटा are uh, giving the real estate sector in india which is uh, look at some point india has enough structural demand right it is a young country uh, household formation is strong and uh, you know it is uh, compared to for example the us where home ownership numbers are very high uh, in india that is uh, that is not the case india has a long runway for home ownership so if you look at it structurally um india has a very good uh, housing story the other thing is that in india a lot of buying has happened with cash and so the penetration of mortgage products in india is very low right in the us uh, 70 75% people jo na uh, housing stock uh, when people buy it uh, is uh, through some kind of financial product mortgage etc india mein bahut under penetrated hai india mein aaj bhi penetration of financial products mortgages is something like 10 or 15% and as that number goes up uh, affordability improves because instead of uh, poning up the entire amount in cash up front uh, you're able to finance it and particularly now at attractive rates because of you know what rates have done so uh, the structural story for indian housing uh, is very sound i think the whole sector is going through uh, uh, you know some sins of the past uh, unfinished projects uh some uh, bad corporate governance on the part of certain players uh regulatory clean up and uh i have to believe that when all of that is behind us uh that uh, indian housing will be a growth sector uh for many years and the advice that i would give uh, somebody in the real estate business is uh is basically what people like oday kotek have said which is uh, don't hang on to inventory at some point uh, it's a market right so the market clears at some price and uh, let price discovery happen even if that means you have to uh, you know sell inventory at slightly lower prices uh, you, you know get your liquidity and then they will always be the next project so that's as far as real estate goes with the caveat that i'm not you know i have no special expertise uh, thank you yeah mr the other question in terms of markets and stocks uh, like everybody said us market is not especially expensive uh, i think uh, you have to pick your sectors the uh, in the indian market i think the crown jewels of the indian public markets to me are our private sector financials and they are very cheap and so if you're looking to buy uh, one thing in india um, i'm a big fan of uh, india's private sector financials i think they are fantastic they're like the fangs um, they have fantastic business model. there there, we, there are no banks like hdfc and axis and kotak and icici anywhere in the world and uh, so uh, if you want a long term investment in the indian equity market the private financials is where i would go thank you many thank you uh, we have one uh, mr jayesh kala who is the coordinator from the institute of chartered accountants of india western regional council jayesh are you there jayesh can you unmute yourself yes yes yeah please go on we invite you to speak yeah thank you it's a really a wonderful uh, session uh, kept by you 
and it is uh, indeed a positive uh, frame of mind and uh, the speakers have uh, spoken in the way the, about the global economy and uh, the effect uh, post uh, covid it is uh, indeed a very good uh, interaction interactive uh, session and uh, i fully thanks uh, thank you uh, ajmera ji sanjay dangi ji and entire team of jito and jpf for organizing this event and on behalf of wrc i really felt feeling overwhelmed by attending this session thank you very much uh, thank you jayesh ji uh, sanjay bhai uh, shall we close it now with a vote of thanks or if, if, want to... if any of the panelists have anything else to say i think they have spoken everything i teammates will close it so, sanjay just one question okay. i have anil here yeah yeah don't please anil ji uh, i think uh, <clears throat> you all spoke about the shale gas and the oil industry going down what is your uh, outlook on renewable in india especially solar mane you can take it yeah so uh, i'll take that really quickly because uh, i have to run in about 5 minutes but the uh, look the outlook for renewables is fantastic and uh, peter and i actually when uh, i'm sure you'll remember peter uh, this is uh, what 12 13 years ago at this point uh, we were short a lot of solar stocks in the US companies like you know half those companies don't even exist anymore because at the time you had to pay $4 per kilowatt hour if i remember right for polycrystalline silicon modules and uh, i think the number was a dollar a kilowatt hour for thin film which for solar mm -hmm. was making now you look 13 14 years later those prices have been cut by a factor of 20 okay and the chinese have had obviously no small part to play in that to a point today where in many many countries uh renewables are uh, cost uh competitive compared to traditional sources of power and uh, certainly in the US that's true uh solar power is cheaper today than uh conventional uh, other forms of energy so i think solar has a huge market in india uh the combination of uh, it's a country that gets a lot of sun uh, module prices are down we have cheap labor which you know a lot of the cost of these projects is installation and wages and you know just paying for uh labor costs so all of those factors come together i think india should do more in the renewable side uh the only thing that we have to watch out for is the grid uh the indian grid uh may not be ready but on the other hand india is a up until very recently was a power starved country power hungry country there are still places in india that have large power cuts every day दो दो तीन तीन घंटा आज भी इंडिया में कई एरियाज हैं जहां बिजली जाती है वो नहीं होना चाहिए एंड आई थिंक सोलर इज द सोल्यूशन द गवर्नमेंट रियली मस्ट डू मोर टू इनकरेज thank you thank you so much without you i think i could have not planned this i called you you said a let's a good idea you and steve was so nice to me then i called manra sir thank you so so much for accepting you know in such a one call you were available and thanks sukhraji nahar who got me introduced to mr uh, manra sir thank you thank you so much now admira ji to you okay and so uh, it was a great session friends uh, we on behalf of the jito professional forum would like to thank everyone who are involved in this uh, especially our uh, knowledge partner the institute of chartered accountants of india western Reg western india regional council the rotary international district 3141 and of course our speakers mr peter mr manraj mr mani mr robert uh, jito apex president ganpat choudhry ji and so many stalwarts of the jito who are attending this program we are overwhelmed uh, with your attendance and of course all the members of jito icai rotary and our invited guest we are all thankful to you for making this program a great success uh, in fact the response was so overwhelming that people have to go over the uh, facebook because zoom was completely full of the capacity full to the capacity so thank you everyone thank you special thank to sanjay bhai for making it is really a great show and of course i would like to thank akash for making it possible as for us to manage zoom technically so very well thank you ravi ajay all our committee members for giving this responsibility of being a convener of this uh, great seminar thank you everyone thank you thank you so much thank you thank so you. much thank you thank you thank you anil ji anil ji is there anil ji thank you yeah thank you, yeah, thank you. a lot thank anil you. ji thank, thank you yeah thank you, yeah, thank you.
Thanks everyone. Okay. Bye. Thank you.